Hello, my friends. In the spring, we have so many choices for wild edibles in New England. And one of the earlier plants that comes out for me to nibble on is a plant called garlic mustard. People either love or hate this plant. Foragers love it because it's unlimited food. Uh, conservationists and people that are sort of native plant purists very much dislike it. The claim is that it produces allelopathic chemicals and that deter the growth of native plants and other plants around it. And there's many plants in the in the family, in the mustard family, and also in sort of trees as well, like hemlocks, that produce allelopathic chemicals to stop other plants from competing with them. I've never found this to be a problem with garlic mustard. It pops up anywhere it wants. So if there's a disturbed area that's had a human come through it with a tractor, uh, a lawn, a field, anywhere that a mustard could normally grow, it'll grow there. And it'll grow in the middle of winter when it warms up, and it'll grow early in the spring. As soon as it flowers and goes to seed, it's done. And maybe there'll be a second harvest later in the season, but it's an early spring to midsummer edible right up until it's done seeding. The leaves themselves, this is a bite out of it, but the leaves themselves are pretty distinct. They have this sort of two thing that is unique to garlic mustard. It's very broad teeth. It is glabrous, so it's smooth on both sides, and it's really wrinkled and has really strong veins. And when you're looking for the plant, you're going to look in waste places, places where other things don't want to grow. There's actually a, quite a few edibles here, but this is an example of a midlife garlic mustard. And the midlife crisis it's going to go through is how many seeds to produce and spread all over this lawn. You can tell by the flowers and the number of pistils and stamens that this is in the Brassicaceae family. Collards, cabbage, mustards, kale, um, Brussels sprouts, broccoli. We eat mostly Brassicaceae family plants that are hybrids of each other, but this is the one of the original sources, aside from Barbaria vulgaris, of human beings' desire to have this broccoli shape. And although it tastes a little bit better younger, and especially in the winter or early spring, at this stage, it's still very edible. Um, I find no problem cooking this up in a stir fry with an oil. So a butter or an oil helps to cut down on the bitterness of this. And if you mix it into a soup, that's going to be no problem as long as there's a fat in it. Um, the allelopathic chemicals it has do not affect humans. You're fine to eat this as a, as a green. Um, obviously, if you have mustard sensitivities, don't have this. And of course, check with multiple sources because you are responsible for what you do, not me. Um, if we were to harvest this, and I'll harvest both of these heads here, you can see that further down on the stem, it's a little bit purple colored. And this color disappears as it gets a little bit larger. So as these grow, this purple will decrease in, in visibility. But sometimes the stem lower down will stay this bright purple color. Now, if I were preparing this for a meal, because it cooks down a lot, I would be picking, you know, two to three cups, which is not hard to do. And chopping it up so that the stems, this part, are small. When it wilts in cooking, the stems tend to not wilt very much. So you can end up with very stemmy um, stir fry or very stemmy soup if you don't do this. So cutting these down is going to be much better for you in the kitchen. And I'm going to show you a couple ways that I like to prepare it right now. Here's another example of a large patch of this. This is These are smaller plants, but as they grow, these will take over a whole area. You can see it's spread all through here. And again, to me, this isn't a problem. Um, but if you want to stop it spreading, collecting its seed pods are essential. So the next phase, when it actually flowers, continuously cutting off the flowering tops, pulling it out, uh, or just making sure you can collect the seeds, but you're never going to catch it in time, are good ways of slowing it down. So as I mentioned, when you're preparing these, if you do not do a good job of looking at the leaf you're collecting, you're going to end up with a lot of these. 
and we want to remove this stem because if you don't, it's going to end up taking up more space than the leaves are. And we're looking for more variety than just that. So it's going to mean coming through and cutting up any of these smaller leaflets. If you want to save yourself some time, this is not really an efficient use of time, try to pick right at the edge of the leaf, and that's going to help you to not have to go back and do this. I picked some like this just to give you this example. Um, bigger stems like this you can keep, just chop them up so that they're in bigger pieces. Same thing with this one, but these little ones are not really going to cook up. The other option is to cut this all really, really, really fine. Um, and that will significantly help. And we'll reduce any of those little pokey uh, leaf extensions on the stems there. When you're preparing this for other people, I really recommend salting this and making sure that it's strongly flavored or has a fat in it because people are going to say it's too bitter. Bitter is good for you. Um, but people are very apprehensive to consume it a lot of the time. Um, and I will admit to you, my prerogative in showing you this is not to complain about wild edibles, but to tell you that they're useful and to tell you that they serve a function. In our current world, we are taught to have sort of black and white explanations of why a plant is there. It's like, it doesn't belong here, it needs to go away. In a way, this is sort of plantism. Like, only native plants are allowed to live in this place. It's a little disturbing of the, of the phrasing. 700 years ago, where, where I lived, the United States looked completely different. Different people lived here, different culture, it's a different world. In the same sense, the current world that we're in does not accommodate many of the native plants that were prevalent in New England in the 16, 17, 18, and 1900s. So we have to make a choice, uh, or a series of choices, and say, uh, we're going to be angry that our native plants aren't doing as well. Um, we're going to be angry and we're going to try to support the native plants and foster their growth and eliminate all invasive plants. Or we find a middle path that recognizes that uh, invasive, or I call them opportunistic plants, serve a purpose. If we disturb soil, if we destroy a river, if we pave a road, if we toxify a field, invasive plants come in because they're not as sensitive to environmental stresses. Um, and not having the, sen the sensitivity to environmental stressors and also being bioremediators, which means pulling toxins out of the soil and making them inert. Um, having these in our environment are helping to clean up that space, but it's a long process. There's a really great example. If you look up English Channel and then Arundo Donuts or Frag Meats or River Reed, there was this case where in the English Channel, Frag Meats or the River Reeds they have there were just taking over the English Channel. And that was one of the most toxic places in England because of all the runoff from the factories in the 18 and 1900s. So the Arundo Donuts is a known bioremediator. So as the pollution decreased through this bioremediation process done by Arundo Donax, they started to disappear. And they had tried poisoning them, they tried herbicides, they had tried physical removal, nothing got rid of them. In time, they receded. And one of the lessons that ecologists took from that was that every plant in an environment that wasn't originally there serves a biological function. And you can think of many invasive plants as scabs. If we hurt ourselves, if we cut ourselves, a scab will appear there eventually after we have some bleeding. Um, and invasive plants are very much like that. When we disturb the soil, when we damage the soil, plants that don't care and are flexible come to live in that space. Because having open, unprotected soil 
means losing that topsoil, and we don't have a lot of topsoil. So maybe we can start to switch our thinking from being angry that these plants are here and they shouldn't be here, and opening up to the possibility of maybe we have some of the strategies to help protect ourselves in the future already here, and that there's a more intelligent plan in, in nature than we think there is. So be sure to look up, research, and identify garlic mustard or Aliaria petiolata. And I really look forward to talking to you guys more about some of my other passion, which is foraging. Talk to you guys soon.